Good afternoon. Uh, we tried to do this briefing as early as we can today so we can get to as many topics as we can before our bilateral meeting at 1 p.m. I have I have one item at the top. Uh, we strongly condemn today's stabbings on a bus in Tel Aviv. There is and can be no justification for such attacks against innocent civilians. We continue to urge all sides to work cooperatively together to lower tensions, reject violence, and seek a path forward toward peace. And as many of you know, the Secretary will also have a press avail with a EU High Representative Mogherini as well after his bilateral meeting. With that, Matt, right. USA uh, Hockey. That's the scarf today. Yes, it is. To note for transcript. Go ahead. USA Hockey. Of course, this was for the Olympics, and then they didn't. It's uh, almost the anniversary. Know. Exactly. Um, let's start with Israel, since you started with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know if you share the view of the White House, your, of, uh, your colleague, Mr. Ernest, that uh, Speaker Boehner's invitation to Prime Minister Netanyahu to address Congress next month is a, was a or is a breach of protocol, and whether or not the administration, uh, I'm also interested in knowing whether or not the administration opposes or, or would not support Prime Minister Netanyahu speaking to Congress. Sure. Well, I think I haven't seen my colleagues' comments, but uh, certainly traditionally we would learn about uh, the plans of a leader to come to the United States uh, separately from learning from it uh, about it from the Speaker of the House, which is how we learned of Prime Minister Netanyahu's plans to uh, come and speak to a joint session. Now, he's spoken to a joint session many times in the past. Uh, that's certainly not something we have opposed, nor, nor do we oppose it uh, in general in this case. We don't have information at this point on what he'll be uh, speaking about. Uh, obviously, we have ongoing discussions, the Secretary does, with Prime Minister Netanyahu about a range of issues, security, the ongoing tensions, uh, those will certainly continue. So, despite the fact that it, you say it was, was a breach of protocol, you're not against the idea? Is no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, exactly. Okay, and you say that you don't know what he is going to speak about, well, the invitation is pretty clear that he, the invitation from Speaker Boehner that wants him, Speaker Boehner wants him to t discuss Iran and the threat of radical Islam. Is that well, we don't have more details on what he'll say. I think we can all make a guess, but what I'm conveying is there hasn't been a discussion about that at this point. Does the administration have any view as to whether um, Prime Minister Netanyahu speaking to Congress on his well-known positions about Iran and about uh, militant radical Islam is is necessary or helpful to the to the discussion going on about well how, I think how to how to, re, how to respond it's no stuff. secret Matt that we have a different point of view as it relates to the benefit of ongoing negotiations uh, with Iran uh, and our efforts to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and Prime Minister Netanyahu has spoken to that extensively. Uh, so that's, but there are many leaders who have spoken to a joint sessions in the past, and there will be many in the future. Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has on many occasions. Um, you said that there's a, a, you both share the same aim, that right, which is to prevent or keep Iran from obtaining. That's right, weapon. and we've talked about that as well in the past. Okay. Um, I'll see, do, do, but I want to stay on Israel. Anything uh, in the timing of the invitation? The timing of the yeah. invitation? I, I don't have any analysis on that. I'm going to do from the After podium. After the day of uh, the presidential, uh, of the president's speech yesterday? I don't have more details on when the invitation was made or accepted. Do you know anything about the uh, re reported Israeli um, uh, strike in the Golan Heights <clears throat> that uh, killed an Iranian general and apparently the son of Imad Mugnia? Um, I don't have more details to speak about on that, no. Okay, well, the, re uh, the result of this strike, whoever did it, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing in the view of the administration? Well, I think, Matt, I, I know our view on a range of issues that these reports take into account, whether it's, um, you know, the engagement of Hezbollah on their destructive engagement from the outside is well known. I, obviously, the details haven't been specifically confirmed by many of the parties, so I'm just not going to well, speculate on them further. Well, let, let me, the Iranians have said publicly that one of their generals was killed. They had a massive funeral for him today in Tehran, um, and Hezbollah itself has said that uh, that uh, Jihad Mugnia was killed. 
So sure. there are some now, details. Like, others you, haven't you have reason to doubt others, those? No, I'm not suggesting oh. that. But there, others haven't confirmed the specifics of what happened here or the alleged Israeli action. That's what I was referring to. I don't have any particular comment on the outcome or the anything beyond that. Well, does that mean the administration doesn't have a point of view of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that these two and others, actors, were taken off the world stage? Are these Well, I, I think I just reiterated the fact that we've long believed that Hezbollah plays a destructive role. Um, we condemn uh, their direct intervention. That's consistently been our view. I just don't think I'm going to add too much more to it than that. Do you that. have any reason to believe that Hezbollah was preparing for some kind of an operation? I don't have anything Israel? more. I can, I can speculate on that. Can I also study this, I'm just talking sure. about the attack today by... Uh, Palestinian um, on a morning bus. I oh, spoke to it at the oh, top. You sp oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. sorry I don't have more details at this point. If that changes, um, I just condemned, obviously, the um, the action. Um, but if more becomes available, we can speak to that later. Okay. Can we talk about Yemen? Sure. Um, so what's the latest on the security situation around the embassy? Have you had any uh, uh, change of heart about a possible evacuation? Uh, what's the security situation there? Sure. Well, uh, as you know, Justin, uh, the safety and security of our men and women serving overseas is a top priority for the president, for the secretary of state, uh, certainly for uh, everyone in the State Department. Uh, we're continuing to not only monitor, but I think you'd all expect to discuss internally the situation on the ground in Yemen, uh, as well as developments in Yemen. And we will adjust to the embassy security posture response in accordance uh, to the situation on the ground. Uh, as you also know, uh, following the um, the embassy has been operating with reduced staffing and heightened security since uh, order departure happened in late September, but there has not been a change at this point uh, in our security posture on the ground. So what's your assessment of whether or not a, a coup has actually occurred? Do you, do you feel there's been a shift in power? Is it too difficult to say? What, what's, what's the status of the Yemeni government's control? The legitimate Yemeni government uh, is led by President Hadi. We remain in touch with him. He is in his home. Uh, clearly, uh, we've seen a breakdown in, in the institutions in Yemen, and obviously there's a great deal of violence and uh, tension on the ground. Uh, we're certainly closely monitoring that and continuing to encourage the parties to continue dialogue, and they are talking. Do you think the president has lost control? Do you worry that he will? Because there, there was this, the question is, if he loses control, will you lose your counterterrorism ally in the region? Well, that's getting a few steps ahead of where we are at this point in time. Uh, I would say that uh, throughout the last several weeks and days, uh, and long before that, our ongoing counterterrorism cooperation with Yemen has continued. Uh, as you know, we believe that it's in our national security interests to have a presence there, uh, and a strong presence there, which is one that we continue to have. Uh, but obviously, we weigh the safety and security of our personnel uh, as, you know, very highly in this internal discussion. Yeah. Don't you think it's a bit disingenuous to say President Hadi is in his home? Well, we're continuing to He's in his home because he's surrounded by Shiite rebels who are may or may not want to kill him. And he remains the legitimate president of the country, well, and we remain in touch with well, him, Matt. All right, but, you know, there's a, <laughs> there, are, there are cases where legitimate leaders are not in position to actually exert their legitimate authority or what you think is their legitimate authority. So, I, I mean, I fear that we're leading down a path where you guys are going to start twisting yourself into pretzels again, like in Egypt, over whether this is a coup or not. Who does the United States believe is in fundamental control of the Yemeni government and military, if anyone? President Hadi remains the legitimate leader of the Yemeni government. Yeah. Does he actually have authority? Can he remains he, if the he legitimate gives an leader. Order, do you think that the, that, 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 that the government or the military will carry out his order while he's under... Matt, While he's clearly, relaxing clearly, at home, as you seem clearly, to Clearly, Matt, this is a very fluid situation on the ground. It's a, it's a challenging situation on the ground. As I mentioned, the parties are talking. We're continuing to encourage that, having discussions about a ceasefire. Obviously, that hasn't been abided by, but we're not going to get steps ahead of where we are. Things continue to develop every single day. Does the administration see the hand of Iran in what's going on? Well, we've talked in the past about, um, you know, the fact that we believe the Houthis have concerning relations with Iran, and we're certainly aware of reports of a variety of support provided by Iran to the Houthis, but I don't have any more details or specifics on that at this point in time. 
Um, and then this is just takes it a little bit more, uh, makes brings it a, a little broader perspective mm -hmm. here, given the testimony that was on the Hill from Deputy Secretary mm -hmm. Blinken this morning. Um, you see, you have, you, you say you have concerns about um, an Iranian hand uh, in Yemen. Um, an Iranian general was killed in, in the Golan Heights, where you say you have also concerns about Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran. Mm -hmm. um, given the fact that, that you believe Iran to be a bad actor, if that's the right word, why on earth would you possibly think that Iran can be trusted to negotiate or to abide by a nuclear agreement? Well, Matt, it's never been about trust. As you know, the nuclear negotiations are about the nuclear issue. Um, if we reach an agreement, it doesn't mean the other issues are resolved. As you know, there are a number of sanctions and restrictions on Iran related to other issues. But we have a fundamental belief that preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon is in the interest of the United States and the global community. That's why we're continuing to, to pursue it. Can I say one more thing? And our belief is that it is not, Iran is not engaged in these negotiations as a favor to the United States or to the Western countries. They're engaged in them because of the uh, crippling effect of sanctions. And so we believe um, that this is an opportunity to finally uh, bring an end to their ability to acquire a nuclear weapon. I, I don't think anyone denies that the, you have a fund, that the U.S. or the administration has a fundamental interest in preventing Iran from getting a bomb. And I also don't think that anyone disputes that Iran is in this, not for the hell of it, mm -hmm. but because they want relief from sanctions. I, I, so I don't think that taking issue with that, th th those ideas or suggesting that people disagree with them makes much sense. So, I mean, they're important contextual points. So fair, I thought I'd well, share okay, them. Well, okay, fair enough. But I mean, I don't think anyone's challenging okay. those, those points. What the question is is that get, that that you th you have observed and seen the administration has Iran acting in what you believe to be a nefarious way in places very far-flung places, but places very close to, to their own territory. Why is it that on this one issue you think that they can be trusted? And the verification is a separate issue. They have to I think that they have to actually agree and then be serious about an agreement. You, right? You're right. It's ver trust but verify and verify again. It's not about trust. It's about having requirements in the JPOA, which they've abided by for the last year plus, and then any agreement that are verifying, that are monitoring, that they're abiding by their agreement. I'm talking about in the run-up to where you get to verification. I and mean, let's leave verification aside, whether or not you believe that that can actually be done or not, the verification part. Mm -hmm. But in the run-up, do you believe, or you believe that so far since the, and where did this JPOA thing yeah, come from? Stick with JPOA? I noticed that Deputy Secretary was uh, saying Jipoa on the Hill. and I'll let the Deputy Secretary of State know that Arshad from Reuters would like him to change how he refers to the Iran agreement. Other people. Too. <laughs> yes. Um, Matt, but I, I, it's the run-up to actually getting an agreement. Mm -hmm. You have to trust them to negotiate in good faith, right? Well, I think we've always said, and I, we could go around and around on this, I realize, but there are requirements. The verification part is very important. It's essential. You can't have an agreement that's workable without it. But you believe that the Iranians have shown to date enough good faith that you can continue to trust them to negotiate in good faith. I wouldn't put it in those terms, but they have abided by the JPOA, the JPOA, whatever you would like to call it. On Iran? Sure, go so, ahead. Yeah, don't you see that the Iranians are benefiting from the negotiations with the P5 plus 1 and with the U.S. to expand their influence in the region, in Yemen, in uh, Syria, elsewhere? Do and how do you think that's the case? In what capacity? Be because look what happened in uh, or what's and happening what's in the Yemen. And what's the what's the connection that you draw between the ongoing negotiations and their engagement with with the Houthis and others? They are, negotiations, uh, they are negotiating with the West, with the P5 plus Correct. One. They're at happening the at the same time. What's the rest of your connection? Uh, look what's going on in Yemen. Right. Expanding you've talked about, you've mentioned Yemen. two events that are happening, not a connection between them. Do we have more on Iran? I'd like to ask where we are. Go ahead. Talks, actually. Sure. What's happening now? I mean, they, they were meeting, the P5 plus one was meeting at the weekend in Geneva. Mm -hmm. um, are they still meeting? Have they wrapped up? Uh, what's the next stage? Was any progress made? What, what happened? Sure. Um, they, uh, last week's, the, the meetings have wrapped up. Undersecretary Sherman uh, is back. 
uh, for a couple of days, and she's, she has quite a bit of travel planned. I don't have any announcement on the next round. I expect we'll have more details on that in the next 24 to 48 hours, Joe. If sooner than that, we'll make it available. Uh, last, we, last week's discussions were serious, useful, uh, and businesslike. We've made progress on some issues, but gaps remain on others. Clearly, there are going to be more rounds of negotiations. Um, as you've seen and the Secretary has talked about, certainly we anticipate he'll meet with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif again in the coming weeks. I don't have anything specific on that yet at this point. When you say she has a lot of travel upcoming, uh, is that with relate with regard to the Iran negotiations? No, not or? necessarily. I just mean she's here, but I don't have anything more on her travel schedule to announce today. Can I, can I ask you, a... There has been this idea of a sort of a framework deal by March, mm -hmm. and, and the President actually refer to that in his State of the Union address last night. It's talked about by spring. Mm -hmm. um, there could be something in place. Um, can you sort of, is, is there a, a sort of date for that? And what exactly are you hoping will be pinned down in March? And then what do you expect will be sure. left towards the end or after those negotiations? Sure. So uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken spoke about this a little bit during his hearing, but let me reiterate some of the points uh, he made. Uh, so on the deadline question, which I know you've had in the past, um, the P5 plus 1 coordinated by the EU and Iran agreed to extend the nuclear talks until March 31st to reach a political agreement and then June 30th to reach all of the technical details. Uh, so a political agreement means, in our view, a political understanding on the elements of a deal so that we can use the remaining months to work out the technical details uh, by June 30th. Right. Okay. And, and are we, sorry, just after sure. these talks. So we're now January the 21st, mm -hmm. so that's kind of nine weeks away mm -hmm. from March 31st. How, how are things going? Well, I don't have any more assessment to add other than the short readout I just gave you of last week. There'll be ongoing talks, gaps remain, we've made some progress, um, but clearly there'll be many more rounds of discussions and negotiations. Is, do you believe that there could be talk of another extension? I'm not going to get ahead of where we are. It's only January at this point. Uh, so I just laid out kind of what our points are that we're looking ahead to uh, over the coming months. Uh, Jen, can we mm -hmm. go back to Yemen? Sure. Uh, do you view any role that uh, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh has been playing in the latest uh, events in, uh, in Yemen? I don't have any speculation on that. I have a question on Yemen. On Yemen? Sure, go yeah. ahead. Great. Um, I just want to follow up on some of the line of question already. I mean, the Houthi leaders called for constitutional changes to increase its power. We have the president, the prime minister surrounded, aviation college, missile base all taken over. Why is there such reticence by the United States to call this a coup? We don't just throw out words just to make all of you feel better. Uh, there is a legal, let me better, finish. Though. There is a legal analysis that would be done in any circumstance, uh, regardless, around the world. Um, this is a scenario where President Hadi remains the legitimate uh, leader of Yemen. We remain in touch with him. There are discussions and negotiations between the parties. Uh, we've seen reports of ceasefire talks. We continue to urge all parties to abide by the terms of the Peace and National Partnership Agreement, the GCC initiative, and its implementation mechanism. That's where we feel. Is it easy? No. But that's how we feel is the best path forward. Those are the discussions we're having with the parties on the ground. So with regard to the legal analysis, again, this seems similar or reticent or reminiscent rather of of Egypt and, and that same reticence to, to call it a coup. I mean, why is that? Is it because of the U.S. counterterrorism efforts that are there. It's is that an what this entirely is different situation. Every country, every situation is different. Uh, that you were talking about uh, military engagement. Obviously, at that time, our policy teams, our legal teams looked at that scenario. If it warranted, we would look at it here, but we're not at that point at this point in so time. So what is the legal analysis that is making this a concern? Why there is There's this no reluctance? legal analysis. President Hadi remains the legitimate leader of Yemen. But you said it was legal mm -hmm. analysis that is making I said this in any scenario around the world, we would do that if it warranted. We're not at that point at this time. There have been reports. Um, um, that the Prime Minister has been allowed to leave his house, unlike the President. Um, have you any idea where he may be? Have I don't have those? any more details on that. Um, we can certainly check if we have more details, Joe. You, know, you said that you don't should throw words around just to make us feel better. Well, I, I, let me tell you what would make me feel better. Knowing where the administration stands on what's going on in, in Yemen and what, the, what whether or not 
the millions of dollars in, in counterterrorism assistance and other aid is going to continue to flow. I mean, I think that that, you know, I, I don't think that's a question of just well, making us feel better. Well, you haven't asked that better. question, Matt. I'm happy to answer oh, it. Oh, okay. Good. On counterterrorism yeah. operations, I think I mentioned in response to maybe Justin's question that that cooperation and work is ongoing, and it has been for weeks and days and months before that. So you don't anticipate or foresee a situation where you would have to reduce or end your assistance, your cooperation with with the, the Yemeni government. And well, military. certainly we don't make predictions about weeks and months in the future. I'm not. I know Today, you're not asking right me to, but I think it's important to note. At this point in time, it's ongoing. We see certainly value in having a strong presence in Yemen, in part because of our continuing work on counterterrorism uh, efforts. Okay. Well, the question is being asked not to feel better, but to know what exactly it is the administration thinks about what's going on and what it's going to do about it, if anything. And right now, it sounds as though you're well, going to wait and let it. Well, what are you confused about? Our security situation, what we want the parties to do, which piece do you not feel I'm you have an answer about on? about whether the administration is comfortable, for lack of a better word, for continuing its cooperation with a government that seems to be, uh, and a president who seems to be teetering on the brink, if not, you know, hanging on to the little branch on the side of the, off the side of the cliff. Well, I think, Matt, just like many scenarios and places where there is violence on the ground, where there's tension on the ground, we're working with the legitimate government, which we believe is President Hadi, to continue to ease tensions, work towards ceasefire talks, see if we can uh, make political progress on that front. That's what our effort is focused on at this point in you time. Know, has there been contact between U.S. officials and President Hadi yes. as he's relaxing yes. in his, uh, we've been in his in, home? We've remained in contact. Mm -hmm. You have. Yes. You know who 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 it is. is I it don't the have an official. I can see if there's more details. Do you on know that. if that's been by, by phone, by radio, by smoke, smoke signal? Has I'm not sure we're going to get into that residents? level of detail, Matt. I do can you know, certainly see if there's do more. You, do you know if he's gone, or if someone U.S. officials have gone have been gone to and been able to get in? To I don't see think him we're going to get into that level of detail, right. Matt. I, I'm happy to and see. And there was an incident apparently yesterday or the day before in which mm -hmm. a vehicle was shot. Sure. Uh, there was, it was last night, so last night, their time, morning, our time, um, an attack on a U.S. diplomatic vehicle occurred at a checkpoint in the vicinity of the embassy. A uh, Houthi gunman at the checkpoint opened fire on the vehicle, but no injuries were sustained during the incident. Um, there is an investigation, of course, that uh, will happen into this incident. Okay. So Houthi gunmen who are backed by Iran opened fire on a U.S. diplomatic car, vehicle, and, and I don't have what, more details on it, Matt, and I'm not okay. going to get ahead of the conclusion of the investigation. Well, but you're to the conclusion, the conclusion is that Houthi gunmen supported by Iran opened fire on a U.S. diplomatic vehicle. Isn't that a problem? I understand your views. We're looking into it. We take our the safety and security of our men and women very seriously, but I won't get ahead yeah, of the investigation. There was that picture, real quick on this, there was that mm -hmm. picture that was all around the internet mm -hmm. yesterday of that Toyota 4Runner. I'm not sure what model it was, but was that the car? I had, sorry, yesterday was a bit of a busy day. I didn't have a chance to see the footage on TV, but uh, I'm no confirming the picture. detail. I'm not aware of another incident like this. Uh, any more on Yemen yeah, before yeah, we continue? Yeah. What's the difference uh, uh, between what's happening in Yemen and what you consider it a coup? I think I just answered that. I don't have anything to add. Uh, go ahead in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you're having discussions as well, that all the parties on the ground, are you in contact or have any of the rebels reached out to be in contact with you and, and or members of the military? You also said that you're working with the legitimate government to ease tensions and uh, towards ceasefire talks. Does that mean that you're working as a sort of go-between between? I wasn't suggesting that. We're supporting their efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to be more clear. We're supporting their efforts to t reduce the tensions on the ground. Um, that's certainly something we support. Uh, any more in Yemen before we finish? Go ahead. Did, uh, did President Hadi like, ask for uh, your help or support through any, like, Possible media. Well, President Hadi has been a partner on these efforts as legitimate leader of Yemen. I'm not going to get into more details than but that. But like for the current crisis, now mm -hmm. that he's uh, like surrounded in his No, I understand house. your question. I'm just not going to get into more details. We remain in close contact. I have to go in a few minutes, so let's try to get to some other Russia? topics. Sure, Russia. I wondered if you'd got a response to the response from uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov um, on the State of the Union address last night. He says the um, Americans are uh, wanting to dominate the world. They set a course of confrontation. 
Um, you know, America's saying we're number one and the rest of the world should acknowledge that. Could I have the U.S. response to that, please? I, I frankly haven't seen Foreign Minister Lavrov's comments uh, today. Um, I'm happy to take a look at them. I think it's unlikely I'll have a specific response to okay, them. Okay, but just on that one, you're taking mm -hmm. a look at that. Can you ask the president somewhat proudly last night in the State of the Union address said that the that president that Mr. Putin uh, thought that there were some who said that Mr. Putin were, was acting very wisely and sagely and showing his end. And then he said that now the Russian eco uh, economy is in tatters, as if this was a great accomplishment. Is that what the administration considers to be a, a great accomplishment, to have a, you know, a, this, the, the, the Russian uh, economy to be in tatters? Well, I think the context of what he was conveying is stating that President Putin is out there touting his leadership of a country where the economy is in tatters. So I'm not sure I would I, I heard it or read it the same way you did, Matt. Oh, well, I, it's not the way I read it. Or it's apparently the way Foreign Minister Lavrov took it. And, okay. And the, well, way, the way other the way, the way others in Russia did as well. So when you're looking into that <laughs> to see if there is any reaction to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov's. Um, Press conference and, and and comments. I would appreciate sure. if you could. Uh huh. Ukrainian President Poroshenko has said today that there are more than nine thousand Russian soldiers currently backing um, the pro-Russian rebels in the east. Does that um, is that something you would agree with? He was speaking in Davos. Is, are those the figures that you? Have? I don't have any confirmation of the figures. I've certainly seen the comments he's made. Um, there have been uh, an increase. There has been, I should say, an increase in separatist violence, including renewed attacks, excuse me, on the Donetsk airport uh, in recent days, and separatist seizures of more of uh, a more ter of more territory. Uh, we've also seen reports um, that two tactical battalions, uh, Russian tactical Russia has moved two tactical battalions into uh, Ukraine. I don't have additional information or independent confirmation of that, but we've certainly seen that. We can confirm, as we've been talking about a bit, that Russia continues to move tanks, armored vehicles, trucks, artillery pieces, and other military equipment to deployment sites near the Russia-Ukraine uh, border, which serve as staging points before transporting military equipment to pro-Russia separatists. That is something we're seeing. I don't have any confirmation of his specific comments. Go ahead. DPRK? Sure. Okay. As, as we know last week... Okay, let's yeah, do that and then we'll do you okay, and then so I may have to James, go here. Go ahead. Okay. As, okay, go ahead, as sorry. we know, uh, some former U.S. officials and experts and some diplom uh, DPRK diplomats had a meeting in Singapore to talk about the nuclear issue. And even after the meeting, the uh, the DPRK's chief negotiator for the six-party talks, he still emphasized that he wanted the United States to suspend the military drill with South Korea. As I understand, last week uh, you have already rejected the proposal on suspending the military drill. But I wonder, it looks like during the meeting they explained the intention and the purpose of the proposal. So I wonder if you have changed your position or if you are considering making some changes about the position. Nothing has changed in our position, and we're not considering making changes to our position. Also, uh, according to some media coverage, uh, the chief negotiator of the uh, six-party talks, he said this time it's the first time he proposed no precondition to, ret to return to the uh, negotiating table. So what do you think of this The chief approach? negotiator from North Korea? The DPRK. Well, I think the important point here is that the view of the United States, as well as our six-party partners, is that uh, the North Korea would need to abide by their uh, international obligations, including the 2005 joint statement. Uh, and so we, the ball has long been in their court, but we certainly reject new proposals that don't have any backing. It looks like this is a positive signal sent by him. So are you still going to just uh, passively, uh, passively waiting for there to form fulfill their commitment? Well, I think we don't take um, threatening rhetoric um, and empty proposals as a positive signal. Go ahead. On Russia, and forgive me if this isn't new, but apparently mm -hmm. they ended officially uh, in December an agreement to work with the U.S. to protect their nuclear stockpiles um, and uh, prevent them from being stolen, which is apparently um, you know, a major breakdown. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is this, do you have any comment on that? Uh, 
I'd have to look into that. It may be something that I talked about back then or we did, but I'd have to talk to our team about specifics on that. I can do one or two more here. I've got two really brief ones. Okay, and then we'll go to you right there. Go well, ahead. Have her go first. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to go back to the Iran point. Dad. Sure. First, one thing going back to the, the deadline. Uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken said that an extension was possible if they didn't you know, dot the I's and cross the T's of the technical details by the June deadline, but is there a similar consideration of an extension if the main components aren't met by March? Well, uh, look, I think right now what we're focused on is what our goals are and our objectives are. And I laid out what we want to try to achieve by March. Um, I'm not certainly, I certainly agree with what the Deputy Secretary said, of course, but at this point in time, we have about two months, if my math is correct, a little over two months um, until we get to the uh, March timeline. So we're not going to get ahead of what would happen past that. And then there was also a lot that came up in this hearing about whether um, the State Department and the administration were adequately consulting versus informing Congress mm -hmm. about the progress of these talks. Can you weigh in on any of the specifics of who you're regularly in touch with? Well, a, a range of, uh, of officials on the Hill. Uh, as you know, many of the discussions and briefings we have with uh, members of the Hill and even their staff are done in a classified setting given the sensitivity of these negotiations. But those are ongoing. Uh, over the course of the last week, I know just from morning meetings here that uh, everyone from Under Secretary Sherman uh, to, I believe, Secretary Kerry to other senior officials have been doing a range of calls with members of the Hill. So it's not just about briefings. There's person-to-person uh, -person contact that's happening as well. And then one more quick one on this. Sure. Um, Senator Menendez at one point said that what he's hearing from the administration on the progression of these talks sounds more like talking points coming from Tehran. Do you have any kind of reaction to that statement? I'm not quite sure what that means. I think our objective has long been to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. I don't think that's their talking point. So uh, certainly you have hearings and we sent our deputy secretary to have this debate and have this discussion and we respect the views of Congress, but I don't really have more analysis on what he meant by that. Go so ahead. Uh, first of those two brief ones on Burma, mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, reaction or comment on the uh, rape and murder of these two Kachin teachers by the Burmese? members of the Burmese military, particularly as it happened around the same time as the American, U.S. and the Burmese military were meeting to discuss, you know, human rights protection. Uh, I have a little bit on this, Matt, um, and if there's more we can uh, address, I'm happy to go back to our team. We are aware of reports that two volunteer teachers uh, with the Kachin Baptist Convention were murdered um, in, a, in a village uh, in northern Shan State. We express our deepest condolences to the families of the victims. We call on authorities to investigate this crime and bring the perpetrators to justice in a credible and transparent manner. The government of Burma has informed us that they are looking into the case. Uh, the facts are still being determined as far as we know at this point in time. And then um, so the second brief one is on, on France, mm -hmm. specifically in Europe more generally. Um, it doesn't have to do with James Taylor, okay. though. Uh, has it raised any concerns in this building or in the broader administration, um, uh, the steps that the French government and, in fact, some other governments in Europe are taking to in response to the, the, the terrorist attacks in terms of um, what appears to be curbing freedom of speech? Well, obviously, a discussion of this is something that's continuing uh, on the ground uh, with our embassy. But I would say that certainly any government, including the government of France, uh, takes steps to protect their people. And certainly we hope and expect that that will be done uh, with a balance of human rights and media freedoms. But I'd have to look more closely on the specific piece you're looking at and talk to our well, team about concerns if we have them. There have been a number of cases reported where people have been uh, detained or arrested or questioned um, over speech that stops short of uh, actually violating any any <clears throat> particular law that they've been accused of um, encouraging or promoting or glorifying uh, terrorist attacks without ha actually having done anything. Is that uh, is that is that problematic? Well, each case is different, Matt. I know there have been a couple cases reported out there. I don't have any concerns to express at this point, but I'm happy to talk to our team and see if there's any we have on the ground. Um, and then, and then the city of Paris, the mayor mm -hmm. has said that she is going to sue Fox News for um, these the reports or this commentary that they that they aired about the no goes alleged no no go zones. 
I mean, is that the kind of thing that the U.S. thinks is uh, is worthwhile, or is is something that you know that that a that a foreign even though it's a <coughs> municipal government, a foreign government should be spending its time and money and effort doing? I would leave that between the mayor of Paris and her office and and Fox News. All right, I'm sorry, guys. I have to go to the bilateral meeting. Thank you, everyone.